Hello and welcome to this special edition of Market Masters. I have with me today Rajiv Jain, Chairman and Chief Investment Officer of the asset management firm GQG Partners. Although Rajiv has enjoyed a storied career with market-beating returns for a long period of time, he really attained celebrity status here in India when he boldly bought into the Adani Group companies last year. This was at a time when the group was going through tough times. That bet, by the way, has already paid off spectacularly well. With assets under management of nearly $130 billion globally, 22 of which are in India, GQG is a force to reckon with and is also one of the largest investors here in the country. Welcome to the show, Rajiv. It's a pleasure having you with us here. Is the, thanks, thanks for having me, Prashant. Uh, Rajiv is an investor who sort of, you know, looks at markets across the globe and invests across the globe. How does India compare to other large developing markets, especially those where there is a good mix of public companies and private companies represented in the stock markets? Yeah, Prashant, as you know, um, uh, there are a few very large uh, emerging markets, uh, and India is one of them. Uh, there, was, there has been too much focus on China, in our opinion, over the last uh, seven, eight years, and that's beginning to diminish. So I think, I think if you look at the larger markets, Indonesia, India, Brazil, Mexico, and so on and so forth, India, I feel, is one of the best earnings throughout story. So if you leave aside everything, simply look at corporate earnings growth over the last five years, which is basically pre-COVID till today, India has seen one of the best earnings growth amongst all emerging markets um, as such, right? So far better than Chinese corporate earnings have actually declined, uh, which I, th I feel this doesn't get enough airtime that the, at the end of the day, earnings drive uh, markets. And uh, when corporate earnings are as strong as it has been, uh, generally the market will follow. And India, Brazil, Indonesia have been some of the best, but India has actually been remarkably strong corporate earnings growth. Do you think we are pricing a lot of that good earnings growth, Rajiv? Well, that's that's a million dollar question, as they say. Uh, I'm not so sure. I think uh, I, I feel that markets typically climb the wall of worry, uh, and there's always angst about having run up so fast. You know uh, that there could always be a pause. But if you take a slightly longer term view, uh, I feel that India still has um, uh, uh, quite a runway. I'm talking about sort of three year horizon. So the valuations are maybe a bit extended, but not not crazy. So because you always have to look at the runway in front, and the runway is fantastic. So uh, I, if I look globally, actually, the two markets that I feel have the right dynamics for very strong returns, one would be after US, I would say, would be India and Indonesia. And even in terms of returns over the last couple of years, I think uh, India and US are right up there, right, in terms of uh, yes. uh, returns that they've given. Uh, and just to sort of press on that point, <clears throat> Uh, one minute longer, one refrain, uh, you know, one quite hears quite a bit nowadays is that there are no worry on the horizon. I mean, you know, uh, things are looking absolutely clear. In fact, I've even heard someone say the only thing to worry about that there is nothing to worry about. Now, that sort of thinking is basically inviting trouble. I just wanted your perspective. Well, you know, things always come from an expect, uh, unexpected areas. For example, uh, if something goes, uh, you know, uh, uh, Middle East could uh, flare up a little bit, oil prices could be could be higher for longer, and there could be a spike. I mean, that's those are the classic India worries people have. Oil prices, you know, although I think there's less impactful than used to be for for various reasons. Uh, I think I think uh, the the biggest worry should be that a lot of mid caps have run a quarter bit. So could there be a pause? Entirely possible. Uh, and then markets. You know, we have these 10, 15 percent sort of shakeouts, uh, or, or some people call it the pause that refreshes. There's nothing wrong with those pauses, but uh, I think I think fundamentals are reasonably robust. So we're actually kind of in a glass half full, not glass half empty uh, mindset. Uh, we do feel that it is not a bad time to be to be a, kind of a risk on, despite the run up. I'm talking about globally. Um, what we've seen does it, 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 you also have to remember that. This is an election year in U.S. Election years typically means that there's more stimulation, whether fiscal policy or monetary policy. Um, inflation is reasonably well behaved. So from a global cross currents, uh, I think the whole inflation spike that we saw two years ago is kind of behind us. Uh, the, the, some of the forward leading indicators of inflation are actually pretty benign globally. Uh, and that has implication of monetary policy. And the elections generally means that politicians typically in, in U.S. also, you would see more stimulus. Uh, and 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 that tends to board well in it's more kind of this kind of more short term view, 
not for a two, three-year view. Okay, let's get specific now. Your big bets in India seem to be uh, the fact that there'll be a big build-out of infrastructure, right? A lot of your uh, Adani Group investments speak to that belief. Uh, these investments have done extremely well for you. Do you think that concerns regarding financing access for the group, for the Adani Group, uh, I mean, you know, for global banks, bond markets, etc., that is largely behind us now? I think, I think there seems to be a common misperception about this group. Mm. So if you look at closely, mm. around, based on our numbers, between 5 to 7% of EBITDA is all that is needed for maintenance capex. The rest of the capex is growth capex, right? Which is much more easier to tone up or tone down based on the opportunity set. And if you look at in India today, uh, uh, the opportunity set is very, very wide. And if you if you look at, for example, the renewal platform, now Adani Green has become the largest renewable green platform in the world already. Orsted, which was the, the, the big Danish company, is struggling. Um, so capital is not a problem in the vast majority of these. I mean, some obviously would be would be more attracted to outside investors because of the the you know the uh, the the mining ex exposure, et cetera. But uh, as as the markets have shown, there's there's more than enough appetite. So that was not a concern, even by the way, in March, April, when we first initiated, as we did the math, that capital is not a problem. Uh, when when you're generating these kind of basically high teen uh, uh, underlying uh, IRRs, capital is always around. Oh, got it. You know, your last big investment was GMR uh, airports, at least the one which was uh, sort of publicly disclosed. Uh, could you share with us what has been the driving logic there? As you know, we uh, we we quite like the airports globally, uh, as long as the regulatory environment is is sort of understandable and stable. Uh, in fact, one of the big be underlying bets for Adani Enterprises was that. And so GMR, after the cleanup of the structure, uh, it's 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 now basically one of the largest airport operators in the world. Uh, the as the regulatory reset comes through, which will happen over the you know in terms of what they get paid. There's a meaningful upside to EBITDA uh, as they go forward, and and I think I think I think this was because of the history of the group with with the other infra assets, which now have been cleaned out. I think this was a little bit less recognized, we thought. Um, and I think I think that also puts some sort of value on enterprises because uh, uh, you know Delhi Airport, if if that is worth 10 billion plus, by the way, we feel that could be worth a, a multiple of that because you still have passenger growth running at mid teens. Uh, I mean, you know, we've talked about airports of Thailand. We talked about some of the other airports, Sydney Airport, large sort of comparable airports. We feel there's not only uh, passenger growth, but also the ability to develop real estate, et cetera, around that, which historically was, was not a, a, as fully monetized as they're planning to do now. So we feel that there's meaningful upside in, in these assets. And as you know, these are very long tail assets. Uh, airlines come and go. Um, I mean, Indigo is a fantastic airline, but uh, but but airports, if they're reasonably well run, have a very, very long tail. So we feel that they should not only have um, a very stable growth, but also will trade at probably higher multiples on a long-term basis. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you mentioned uh, enterprises. Uh, you were talking about the uh, so the, uh, the, uh, the Mumbai airport, the Adani uh, airport? Yes. Within, yes. housed within. A, so just, I mean, could you just run us through that once again? I mean, what what's the valuation argument there? Uh, and, and how does it connect with your investment logic in GMR? So um, the, the, as you know, they own six airports, yeah. and Navi Mumbai would be probably be done end of this this year. Uh, it may you know end of this year or maybe early next year, but it'll become uh, the largest airport as such in the world with passenger volume growth running at mid teens. And there are other sort of abilities to monetize around that because I think if you look at Zurich Airport, Zurich Airport has monetized a lot of different things around Zurich. Uh, same thing for uh, Paris, uh, same thing less for Frankfurt. Uh, so there's, lo there's a lot of ability to monetize not only the passenger, but also the revenue which can be generated in the ecosystem as such. If you put reasonable valuations that at that point last year, as you know, when we bought the first tranche of Adani Enterprises, we thought the airport itself was worth more than the company. And the copper business is coming online maybe in a few months, uh, probably six months. That could be a billion dollar plus EBITDA alone. Uh, so I think I think I think when you add these up, we thought we were getting basically everything else for free. Not to mention, I mean, look, I mean, uh, 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 the the management. Uh, uh, if you look at uh, Gautam Adani's track record, I mean, his track record is phenomenal in terms of creating value. So, just the airport itself was worth more than enterprise we thought. And now, if you look at the other things that have come up, so the funny thing about some of these names is that the earnings growth in the last twelve months, basically twelve months or so since our first investment, has been quite quite. You know, quite uh, quite fantastic. I mean, versus what we were expecting, March, April. So 
the delivery has been quite remarkable. So I think I think that's an important part because the whole whole infrastructure space in general has delivered very strong returns. There was some talk and there were a lot of reporting, etc., which uh, said that you were involved in the recent big Vedanta block deal as well. Were you guys involved in the deal? No, we were not involved in the deal at, at all. So I think I think it's it's kind of amusing to see almost every deal our name comes up. So it, there's no point denying every deal because you know there's, there's a deal every week. Uh, so no, we were not involved at all. We, we you know we didn't buy a single share. I see. Well, were you were you were you sort of talking to them at least, or or, or there was n nothing at all? I mean, you were not. Uh... Well, we, we, look, I mean that—that's our job. We meet a lot of managements, okay. uh, and we look for um, uh, names where there's a little bit of sort of perception gap, and the structural assets are good. So we, we talk to a lot of people all the time, mm -hmm. uh, but that was you know kind of very specific announcement. But but there have been cases in almost every uh, QIP, our names get dragged in for some reason. So mm -hmm. you know we can't keep denying everything. So to press that point just a minute longer. Have you taken a look at Vedanta? Any thoughts? I mean, that's, that would fit that criteria, right? Gap in perception, good assets. Look, I think, I think, I think we, uh, we, we have looked at them. Uh, uh, but at this point, it'll be sort of inappropriate to specifically comment about, you know, names where, where we don't have existing position uh, as such. Got it. Now, PSUs are the other space, Raji, which have done phenomenally well, right? That's another area where there has been a sea change as far as perception is concerned. You own large names like SBI and NTPC. Have you looked at others in any areas where you think, which you think will do very well? I know for a fact that you think this is, uh, you know, uh, oil and energy markets are in for a structural bull market. Uh, a lot of exposure in the PSU space there in that area, and stocks have done well. Your thoughts, Rajiv? So uh, we, we looked at the the, the oil names, uh, and we if, if they were more liquid, larger liquid, probably would have bought them uh, because. For the last two and a half, three years, we've been very positive on a lot of PSUs. I mean, include State Bank of India, NTPC, Power Grid, and we own in, a, in some small and large way. Um, I think I think some of these are basically look at our size and scale. We can't execute because sometimes blocks are not available. By the way, LIC is the same one. Uh, we, we, we would have loved to buy that. They, they, they were, we couldn't find any blocks last year, uh, early last year. So so I think, I, think, I think some of these are hard to execute from our vantage point because we like to run a very constant book. But I think one thing which is, and these were not simply cheap. What we saw was just much more tighter management. Uh, I mean, if you look at NTPC, uh, we, we quite like how you know the 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 the, the current management has done a you know much better job versus historically. So there's this this sense of urgency you're seeing in in bunch of these, and uh, and I think I think they're also getting a lot less intervention from 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 Delhi, which which was a chronic problem historically, right? So in last ten years, the intervention has gone down dramatically. In fact. They pushed to hire some very competent people. A lot of a lot of these companies. So, so I think I think long term we like these. But uh, obviously, today a lot of them are done well. We still like them. Uh, but our problem sometimes is that we like to run constant portfolio and just hard to execute in a, because those are blocks that are hard to find. But otherwise, I think and as you know, these things are very under owned by vast majority of foreign investors too because there's this this perception there that you know state owned companies are always bad. Nothing is always bad. Mm. Um, and nothing is always good for that matter. Mm. Uh, so we are talking about, uh, when you say what you like, we basically talk about PSU oil companies, right? Upstream, downstream, standalone refiners, yeah. right? We don't own any of those. We, you, we don't you, own, because look, I think, I think, I think uh, first of all, we have only X amount of dollars we can invest in India. Yeah. We almost have a third of emerging market fund in India, right? So I'm not running an India book. Yeah. Uh, so so I, it, it's, there were too much choices. Yeah. No, uh, so we but, don't own any oil companies, but we do own some of the oil companies outside. Got it. But you like that space in India, right? Uh, that's the thing. You don't own it. Yeah, we generally like that space. Got it. Got it. Uh, <clears throat> fair enough. You know, let's just talk about PS, uh, private sector banks uh, for a quick bit, uh, Rajiv. You used to own HDFC Bank. You don't anymore. Uh, you know, you still own ICICI Bank, I think uh, IDFC First Bank, uh, SBI I mentioned earlier. Uh, just a view on HDFC Bank because that's been such a sort of you know uh, long-term compounder, which for the last couple of years has basically gone nowhere, and a lot of questions around that. Uh, any any thoughts? Look, I think I think uh, these both HDFC and HDFC Bank were some of our core holdings for a long, long time. I mean, I first bought HDFC I believe in 1998 and mm -hmm. held it through thick and thin. And HDFC first time I bought in 2001, late 2000, early 2002. 
and 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 uh, and I always joke around that if you look at these two names, that uh, that that made me look a lot smarter because we bought them and we didn't have to do anything and they kept compounding, right? I like management where we kind of take a backseat and and they do the job, uh, and, and these were some of those. So. However, I think I think um, uh, we we just thought there were better opportunities last year, so we we did exit HDFC Bank, and I think and I think some of this is simply uh, kind of um, uh, transition issue that we are facing in terms of the you know that was a big merger more than any structural problems. We don't see any structural issues. It's more a transition issues in terms of you know the two big entities have merged, but on our case, we just had sort of you know we, as I said, we have limited amount of dollars where we, what we can invest, so we look for the best bank for the buck, and we thought the SBI has far bigger disconnect um than than hdfc which is you know which is a very very high quality franchise uh, and it's it's very likely we'll own it somewhere down the line again i know that's uh, that's well put uh, uh for psu banks which is the other space which has done well do you think there is a lot more room in terms of re-rating uh i mean evaluations have come up uh, to one one and a half times book for most names yeah, look, I, I I don't believe there's more re-rating potential. I mean, the whole unless the whole market re-rates. Mm. Um, now it's an earnings growth. We'll have to you know do the job. Okay, uh, that's the view for uh, PSU banks and for HDFC Bank. You're saying that you perhaps will own it at some point down the line. Now, uh, Raji, let's talk about consumption, right? Because uh, that, for a fund as large as uh, yours, and you've got over twenty billion dollars invested here in India. Uh, a lot of straightforward consumption bets, and India was always seen as a big consumption story. A lot of straightforward consumption bets are missing. You have those, uh, but not the typical large ones. Why is that? I think, um, uh, you know, as you know, markets are nothing but arbitraging machines. So they will arbitrage what is obvious. Mm. So you really have to look at some level of disconnect to get sort of outsized returns. Uh, and a lot of consumption names we thought got re-rated quite dramatically. So if you go to the post GFC, uh, you could, and we, we bought a whole bunch of them from Nestle to Indus Onion Liver and so on and so forth. Uh, they were they were reasonably valued for the growth that they were delivering at that point. A lot of those names, which are still fantastic franchises, but the disconnect isn't there. Not to mention the relative earnings growth is far better in some of the other areas. Uh, so we do own ITC and Patanjali, as you know, but besides that, we uh, we we haven't really owned that much uh, for you know the reasons that I just cited. So uh, I think the consumption story is still alive and well. The relative earnings growth will be lower than some of the other infra areas, and that could, by the way, five seven year story. It's not a two year story in terms of relative earnings growth between those. Second, I do believe that the competitive intensity has gone up. If you look at the volume growth that you've seen in some of the larger players, it's been on a softer side versus their own history. Could that be short term cyclical? Maybe, uh, but but I think I think I think I think there's something to watch. Uh, got it. What about IT services? I mean, I know that you have a uh, you know globally. I think Nvidia is one of the largest positions for you. Uh, you know, you own other large uh, sort of tech names as well. What about IT services here in India, Rajiv? Yeah, IT service services. Uh, we we have been a little more cautious for almost eighteen months now, mm -hmm. um, uh, and and we feel that the valuations are not incorporating what we feel would be a slightly slower growth profile on a go-forward basis. So the markets are far more comfortable with the growth, uh, you know, the rate of growth that these companies can possibly deliver. Uh, and, and second thing is we find from a tech perspective, just better opportunities elsewhere um, for, for the same, if not better growth, you can find it cheaper outside. So, you know, we feel that there's, there's much, much more bang for buck in other names in India than IT services. Uh, Rajiv, as a, as a, as a invest, as you said, you like to, you like things where there is a big uh, sort of disparity between the reality and the perception of it. Do you think China fits the bill, or 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 their bad is just bad? I, 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 are you are you looking at it as a interesting investment opportunity? China is confusing because things uh, the stock prices have come off quite a bit. However, the the lot of policy issues, the geopoliticals, uh, political aspects have not gone away. So we have not increased our China exposure. Uh, we are extremely underweight China. In fact, we only have four or five percent China. I mean, that should give you some context. That's in EM. We have nothing, no exposure in the global or the, in the international book as such in China. And and four or five years ago, we used to have a lot. Uh, but we do feel that there's there's a geopolitical aspect which is playing an important role. Uh, in terms of how people will perceive China. So, for example, if Trump wins, uh, I think there's there's a high chance of uh, escalation geopolitically between U.S. and China. Uh, and that could impact 
uh, foreign investment into China and and or their reluctance to invest further. So I think I think the the things on the horizon which kind of give us a little bit of pause. Um, uh, and and Trump has already uh, announced some of these things that if he wins, he's going to increase tariffs and so on and so forth. So I think I think the saber rattling will increase, which is you know which which is a little bit of a problem. Rajiv, uh, you know, in terms of China, there's this entire China plus one, not just in terms of FDI, et cetera, but in terms of financial flows, portfolio flows. And many have said that, uh, you know, <clears throat> India will be this big beneficiary of foreign flows away from China. Is it already underway or is that yet to happen? Your view? There hasn't really been much inflows at all. If you look at cumulative inflows in the last two and a half, three years. They've been one of the biggest outflows from India. So I don't feel that has happened yet. But if if the geopolitical situation continues to go move in the direction where I believe it's moving, it's just getting worse. I think the flows can have yet to come to India. We have not seen that yet. If you look at vast majority of global portfolios, the India exposure is tiny, and it's typically limited to maybe one private sector bank, one IT services, and that's about it, right? And 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 all that will change because the earnings growth, if it comes through. And it has been coming through, as I said, India is the best earnings growth story outside of U.S. in the last five years. It's not my opinion. It's a fact. If you look at MSCI India versus all the MSCIs and compare that to other markets. So I think the flows story has not been positive for India. In my opinion, it will become positive as time passes. Uh, got it. Rajiv, we leave it there. It's a pleasure having you with us here on CNBC TV 18. We look forward to many of these over the next uh, you know, a few months. Appreciate your time here, as always. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. It was good to talk to you.